Okay, cool. So the talk of today is uh, going to be about uh, toward robust and stable deep learning algorithm for forward, backward, stochastic differential equation. So it sounds quite sophisticated, but actually uh, the main idea is using deep learning to solve partial differential equation. So a bit about me, I'm a PhD student uh, in the uh, computing department of Imperial College London. Um, and my supervisor is uh, Panos Parpas, and I also work with two other guys from the uh, math department. And uh, it's very, um, it's a very great team, and it enables me to have like both the computing side and also the math side with more like stochastic processes, uh, all these uh, techniques and knowledge. Uh, so just don't hesitate uh, if you're interested in doing a PhD or a postdoc to uh, contact me or one of the three guys uh, on the page. And my domain of interest right now is uh, smoothing techniques and also implicit gradient methods, uh, which is slightly different from uh, uh, the main topic of today. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm also doing an internship right now with uh, JP Morgan AI and machine learning. A bit about uh, this work. So um, this work is a joint work with uh, Batwan and uh, Panos Partas based on our master thesis uh, last year. Uh, we had the opportunity to present this project at NeurIPS 2019 in Vancouver uh, last December during the uh, Robust AI in Financial Services workshop. So the paper is available on archive and uh, you can see the poster we have presented on my uh, personal website. So, um, so the journey uh, is defined like this. First, um, I will give you an introduction and some motivation uh, to this uh, talk. Uh, then I will uh, try to establish some links in between partial differential equation and stochastic differential equations. Then we'll move to uh, des designing a neural network uh, to solve this problem. And then we'll conclude by uh, studying stability, generalization, and also computational efficiency. So first of all, um, really quick uh, introduction about uh, PDEs. Uh, I'm sure uh, you're quite familiar with them uh, because you can see them almost everywhere in uh, like quantum mechanics, green mechanics, um, and especially in financial mathematics, um, as during the talk, I will mention uh, some examples from the Black Scholes equation. So, the problem we have with PDEs is um, mainly we don't have closed form solution, uh, which is a problem, and um, we need to use numerical techniques uh, to solve them. And the problem is also when we uh, deal with super high dimensional um, PDEs, um, we may face uh, the curse of dimensionality, uh, which is basically an exponent exponential uh, computational uh, expenses um, with respect to the dimension. So first of all, um, I will try to, to define some links between PDs and SDs, but before establishing these links, I want to, uh, um, all of us to be on the same page. And so I will define first a stochastic process. And a stochastic process um, can be defined by its uh, uh, differential, um, differential equation. So this is this object, right? And uh, there is a drift term and also a volatility term. And so the drift term is associated with DT, which is a discretization in time. And DWT is actually discretization in the Brownian motion. So you may ask what the Brownian motion. And I can say to you, it's basically the limit of a random walk uh, when the time uh, goes to zero. Um, and for you to, to understand like quality, in, in, in to, to have the intuition about those two terms, I've plotted two, uh, two different uh, paths here. So you have this path, which has um, a pretty large uh, drift, but almost no volatility. So there is like very little noise. 
and this path in black where there is like a large amount of noise due to this um, large amount of volatility I've put in this path, okay? So there are quite a lot of uh, famous stochastic processes. Um, I put uh, three of them for the geometric uh, burn and motion, uh, which is often used um, for uh, the black short equation uh, to model the uh, prices. The uh, often Hulenbeck uh, process, um, which is um, used to uh, model um, um, interest rates uh, and also uh, everything uh, with um, uh, foreign exchange, for example. And um, the third one is the Cox in Gersol or Ross, uh, which is um, here often used for interest rates. And you can notice here you have a square root of X. Um, and basically, this uh, stochastic process uh, is not supposed to be negative. So um, I take a very simple example uh, here, which is a Brownian motion. So let's say we have this um, stochastic differential equation, and we can basically establish the link between this stochastic differential equation and the transition probability by something called the fokker plant equation. So that's this equation. And um, if it's unclear, I want to, um, uh, to make it clearer um, with this easy example of Brownian motion. So here I have basically uh, plotted one uh, different path from a Brownian motion. And the Brownian motion is only this, this equation. And uh, you can see here after like t equals to one, uh, you have like a distribution of the value of the different paths. It turns out this distribution is a Gaussian. So visually it looks nice and you can also confirm this uh, from the equation. If you uh, make mu equals to zero and if you take um, sigma equals to one. You just have a one here. You don't have this term, and you only left with uh, the heat equation, where we know the solution is a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so that was only to show you like there is a link uh, between those probability distribution and like PDEs that has that are been ruled by PDEs and SDEs. Okay. So this was in the case where the uh, SD is uh, linear. So here, obviously, it's slightly more evolved because we deal with nonlinear uh, PDs. So they have to be uh, of this form. But the concept is the same as uh, the previous slide. Uh, there is like an equivalent uh, system of uh, SDs. And uh, you have like one equation on X and another equation on y. So this one is called the forward. And the second one is uh, the backward. And the backward is ruled by a terminal condition and the forward is ruled by an, this initial condition, okay? So at this stage, the idea was like, okay, why not trying to map the function y equals u of t and x of t? So an easy way to, to think about it, again, I will take an example that could be, let's say, a call option. And in that case, x would be uh, the price of the stock and y would be the price of the option. Okay, and t would be the time. So we basically want to learn this function using a neural network. And the uh, convenient thing by using a neural network is that we can also um, compute the gradient of, of u with respect to x, which basically gives the last term in the equation, which is z, which turns out uh, to be here, okay? So this is a, a simple uh, discretization in time. 
Uh, it's important to, to say this because there is no discrete suggestion in space. So that's basically the main argument to say uh, we basically tackle this curse of dimensionality using this. Okay, so neural network, I guess you all used to this, but I just want to, uh, to show like there is our vector uh, x of t, which uh, with d component and uh, the last input, which is the time, and we want our output uh, y of t, okay? Uh, in our case, we just put uh, a scalar output uh, because it was easier um, to uh, conduct experiment in that uh, framework. So what we do is, is actually quite interesting. So remember our discretization in time. So basically for each time step, um, we, we make some prediction y0 and z0 that I used to compute um, x1 of the next step. And then we make prediction. And then again, through the, uh, the n different time steps, starting from t equals to zero to uh, t equals to uh, tn, okay? Um, and what is also important here is that we uh, use the same shared parameter through time uh, because it was, uh, I guess, more convenient instead of having like, again, n different neural networks. So the last function, um, okay, it looks a bit sophisticated, but again, it's, it's not uh, that crazy. Uh, you have the prediction here, and we just make the difference between the prediction and what could be in our case called the ground truth, uh, which is not, but we take as a ground truth the Euler scheme based on the previous prediction. And to finish, there is this last term here, which is basically the difference between the prediction and uh, our um, terminal condition that we know. Okay, so here uh, is an example we have, uh, we have done with um, an easy terminal condition. Again, we wanted our output y to be a uh, scalar. Uh, even though x is um, 100 dimension here. And also because uh, in this form, we know the closed form solution of this um, for the black shore equation, which is that one. And that solution is used as a ground truth to compare our prediction that are in red and the ground truth, which is in black on, on that plot. And here it's just the uh, aggregation of the uh, of the um, relative error we measure between the different paths. Okay, because here I only plotted like two paths, but in our setup we had like 100 different paths, and this error is only like zero, the mean error um, over all the different uh, trajectories. So what we can see is that it, it works pretty cool on this on these examples. Um, and uh, we wanted to, um, to go a bit further by studying the stability, the robustness of this, of this solution. So I will skip those two slides uh, for now. And if you have any question, I can answer them uh, later uh, because these two slides are about um, ResNet and NiceNet that are, um, that are well known for their stability. They are like architecture of neural network uh, but I guess I don't, it's, it's not worth going into the detail uh, right now. But just so you know, um, these um, two um, architecture are um, well known for the stability and we wanted to use them uh, to make sure um, it indeed improves the stability and generalization. So how can we like measure the generalization? In our framework, the only thing the neural network can overfit on is basically the initial condition. And so what we wanted to, to do is slightly move the initial condition and check the relative error. And what we can see here is that um, like the relative error from NaseNet is, is lower than um, 
TQ over architecture, which uh, which is pretty which is pretty good. And here on the second graph on on the right, you can see like three different paths of the loss function uh, during our training. And in the initial setup, we have like a feed forward neural network, and we had like some massive spike here and here. So you can imagine uh, probably the uh, algorithm was stuck in some local minima. I managed to escape here and then you learn again, manage to escape and learn again, which is really non smooth as opposed to the um, curve in, in red and, and gray. Uh, that are the curve obtained with ResNet and NiceNet. Okay. Um, last thing we have tried during this project is basically how can we speed up the experiment? So remember, this is a disc discretization in time we have for our path. And the discretization in time is here, h equals like delta t. And what we wanted to do is basically start with a relatively large time step, uh, train a bit our neural network, and then refine the steps until we reach the desired uh, discretization level. Um, so this is kind of a warm-up procedure, and it worked uh, very well. So I can I can show you the result here. So on this graph, on the uh, left uh, graph, you have like different level from the same uh, stochastic path. So for example, that one is level one. So you have only like three point, and then. Uh, when it's more um, uh, intense in, in red, you have like more points up to the uh, last one, which is in black, where you have like all the points of the path. But basically what we did is we started with the very light pink path. We train our neural network and then we refine the path, train the neural network, refine the path, train the neural net, etc. Until, until we reach the desired time step. Uh, which was uh, 50 time steps uh, per uh, t equals to one, okay? And we had like surprisingly good results. Um, so these are the time obtained in, uh, in second for the three different uh, architecture. And uh, what we can see is like basically a ratio like uh, time, time step in terms of, uh, of efficiency. So we're really happy with that result. And, uh, and so we can see even like super uh, sophisticated architecture has nice net are quite competitive if we can lower the time to only, uh, I guess, sorry, it was in, in, in minutes, sorry. Uh, in, if we can learn our neural network in only 11 minutes, uh, which is quite competitive. And again, NiceNet um, um, led us to really good results in terms of stability and generalization. So to conclude, um, I can say that we like review the different techniques uh, to solve high-dimensional PDs uh, using deep learning. Uh, we understood better stability, the robustness and generalization. And we also have tried like different architectures as ResNet and NiceNet. And we also managed to improve the uh, time computation by um, an order of magnitude using this uh, multi-level technique. Future work could be uh, focused on uh, more advanced discretization techniques, sampling techniques. And also, obviously, we only tried a couple of equations, including um, black Scholl, uh, Hamilton, Jacobi but there are a lot of different equations and we can also think about different terminal conditions as well. Um, so that's it for, for the talk. Uh, thanks uh, for, um, for having listened to me. And uh, if you have any question, I would be happy to uh, try to answer them. Yeah, thanks a lot, Alexis, for giving this talk. It's very, been very interesting. So for everybody that has a question, you can just put it into the chat or you can also unmute yourself and ask the question like that. So I will just give you a minute or so right now to type or to unmute yourself. And otherwise, I think Stephen and I might have some questions too.
while people are thinking about what they're asking, uh, maybe a first question, what got you into the topic, first of all? Sorry, say it again. What got you into this topic, first of all? What was the thing that made you think, I will do my master thesis about this? Um, yeah, okay. Um, it, it, it's quite interesting. Uh, um, again, it came from uh, discussions with uh, Panos Parfas and he's um, mainly focused on the optimization techniques. And uh, he had seen a couple of papers um, saying maybe we could use deep learning to solve PDEs. And um, he said, I think it's going to be a relatively uh, challenging project uh, because at the very beginning, he was only thinking about uh, using like LSTM and data um, on uh, financial data. And you know, it's quite hard to have access to financial data. Uh, so he suggested we move to this more uh, math oriented uh, project and uh, uh, I was like that could be a good option and uh, and so we, uh, we we went for this project and um, it quickly became like super interesting and super intense also because um, like I could say one year ago I had no idea about uh, stochastic processes and what was uh, basically SDs and, and everything. And now I'm, I'm way more familiar to this, and uh, and it's mainly it mainly comes from this from this project, and it's like so useful today because uh, I'm I'm doing this PhD, and I'm also actually dealing with PDs and SDs quite a lot, um, so uh, it's it, it yeah that, that that could be the main reason um, why we uh, we ended up uh, doing this. Uh, and again, it, it just turned out we, we managed to obtain pretty good results and uh, we had this opportunity to, to go to NeurIPS. That was like really exciting moment. Um, even though we haven't, um, uh, we haven't um, like um, studied um, this project uh, uh, in, in, in more depth and we moved to another project, but I'm sure there's like uh, probably first uh, some um, some broad applications for this uh, like let's say I'm sure we can like even like maybe stick to this black shell model but try like more sophisticated uh, terminal conditions just maybe try uh, um, as I said maybe a, a call option or this kind of stuff uh, I guess we can also use it maybe for edging or pricing um, so I guess that could be a powerful uh, tool. Um, even though you have to be aware, obviously in banks, they already have like super powerful uh, tools to, uh, to deal with this, but I'm sure that could bring another, um, another view on, on how you could do pricing and, uh, and edging. And uh, actually a lot of people, um, including people from JP Morgan are actually uh, using um, neural network um, to uh, to do either pricing or uh, edging, so that this way is only a, a way to see things, and obviously you can like use different ways to price or to edge, but um, that's an interesting way of seeing things. So obviously, uh, in this setup, uh, you have to rely on the black shell equation. Um, what could be interesting as well is to add like more uh, terms to the black shell equation. So not only stick to its uh, basic uh, formulation, but add more term to, um, to take into account the risk of default, for example. And I'm sure in that context, our system uh, would be able to, uh, to solve this, uh, this problem. Um, you may also want to investigate what happened when we, you deal with American options, uh, because as you know, it's, it's, it's a bit more delicate, uh, delicate problem as opposed to European options. Uh, obviously I'm, I'm talking a lot about finance topics, but uh, uh, I'm sure we can probably see applications in, uh, in physics as well. Yeah, I was just thinking, given your background also in civil engineering, it would be quite interesting to know where you think you could have the highest impact with this. If it's just finance or if it's also in other parts. Um, okay, that, that, that's quite an interesting question. Um, 
Okay, so to, to be honest, I think like every field has its own way of dealing with um, like technical um, side of it. And in civil engineering, at least for my part, uh, we were not uh, often dealing with PDEs and we were um, more often dealing with some like uh, programming language to like define stresses and, and nodes and, um, and try to, uh, uh, to come to uh, to come up with some cases of of loads uh, to try let's say to to uh, uh, to design a bridge uh, with like different uh, lorries or cars or or stresses event. Um, so I guess the only parallel I can make is uh, is like different scenarios of where you have like the normal one, the stressing one, and the more exceptional one. But I can't see any application of um, of of um, of, of PDEs in, in, that, um, in that field. However, uh, um, you probably are aware of that, that civil engineering is not super advanced uh, in terms of, of uh, neural network. Uh, and data, we, we do, we, I did a bit of data science, right? But I'm, I'm sure this, this field could benefit a lot from, uh, from new advances in, uh, in neural network and machine learning in general. It's just um, a slightly reluctant for now. Um, I guess in five, 10 years, um, um, I'm sure we'll see loads of neural network and civil engineering as well. Yeah, thanks for your answer. So let's go back to the participants. Is there anyone with a question? In that case, you can just unmute yourself. So if not, uh... I would have a question to, I think it was slide 11 or 12. Um, yeah, I think it was this one. Um, so my question here, the way how you train that, so you just train the network in each um, time set, right? Like for time step zero, for instance, the left um, No, so we basically, um, had we basically construct our loss function uh, based on all these different steps, but the training is only done on this loss function, which gathers um, all the different time steps, right? So it's not like if you were um, doing this, the first step uh, and then trying uh, training here and then do another step and string doesn't work this way. Uh, you do all the steps that, that enables you to have access to this quantity. And according to, to this quantity, you try to, uh, uh, to minimize it, right? Uh, with, with respect to the weight of the uh, neural net. Okay. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Could you go back to 11 again, please? Yeah. Uh, but I do agree with you, it's quite an interesting slide because as I mentioned during the, the presentation, uh, we made that choice of using only one neural network with shared parameters. Um, but I guess you, you could come up with like n different neural networks and as you said, like try to learn like very this, um, exclusively this mapping between x0 and y0. But that's, a, that's not a choice we made. Um, and concerning the back, back propagation, so you, you have the, 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 the loss <laughs> function on this next slide, right? But do you like propagate back along this, the, the arrows that we're seeing here, or is it like yeah. the back propagation per time step? Uh, so the back propagation goes all the way down to uh, the very first step. Uh, that's very difficult to mentally represent that. Uh, and, okay. the, and because you have to imagine like actually X1, Xn, sorry, has been built by the previous result mm -hmm. of Y n minus one and Z n minus one because of the non-linearity, it feeds that guy. So you already have prediction here when you in the input of the last uh, steps, right? Uh, which 
makes the propagation like super um, delicate to do, but obviously, uh, uh, thanks to PyTorch and, uh, and TensorFlow, uh, you don't have to do it manually, but you have to take care uh, it indeed goes uh, all the way down to uh, to this, right? Mm. Um, and this is because we deal with um, nonlinear equation um, and uh, because of the Brownian motion probe, right? And can, yeah, um, if I can show you, yes. So in this equation, you can see like mm. uh, indeed x depends on y t and uh, z t, right? Mm -hmm. So that 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 dependence uh, make it make it tricky, um, and it only comes with the nonlinearity, uh, as opposed to what you said in the easy case of Brown motion. You don't have like any nonlinearity, and uh, mm. there is no such a thing of back propagating uh, all the way down. Um, out of curiosity, did you also publish um, your code? On GitLab, GitHub. Or yes, so you can you can access the code on um, on my GitHub. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, if you want to access this, uh, you can go to my uh, personal website, mm -hmm. uh, which is this. Yeah, I think we will um, also um, link both of those links later on on our YouTube page. Okay, cool. Personally, yeah, I wonder like. Yeah. How you implemented this um, slide eleven because it doesn't look very trivial to be fair. And um, um, no, it's not. Uh, it's not. And as I said, I guess the most uh, tricky thing was basically to do to compute this uh, loss function. Mm -hmm. um, in theory, you should be able to only take like the last uh, step and say I want uh, like the smallest difference for the last steps. Uh, but in our case, we just wanted to make sure like all the step um, has, um, has been taken into consideration when we try to uh, minimize um, the, uh, the loss function. And as you mentioned uh, with your question, um, it, it made things uh, quite, quite tricky, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thanks um, for your presentation. I think that was like from my side um, about questions. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm just looking. Uh, no one is raising their hand and there are no further questions in the chat. So in this regard, if there, if everything is completely clear, I think you did a great job. If everybody understood everything perfectly. There's and someone thanks. Raised hand, apparently. Uh, Luca? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I have one question. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'm interested in uh, how much uh, this deep uh, neural network approach uh, are really applied in a uh, real world work environment uh, or are they still like more in the research, uh, research level and still testing if they are really applicable? Yeah. Okay. So it's, uh, it's a good question. Um, so I would say uh, for now, um, I don't think it is used as such uh, by uh, banks or hedge funds uh, right now. Um, it raises a, an important question because uh, when I was uh, in Vancouver, um, I've actually seen like different research papers on uh, on finance, and actually a few came from uh, uh, JP Morgan. Um, so it, it's quite cool as I'm doing an internship now. And the way it's done is uh, we only publish things um, that we believe are not possible to be used um, today. So obviously, if we find something great that improves our business, uh, we obviously don't want to share it with our competitors. Uh, but at the same time, um, there's like loads of departments working on uh, on quite advanced research. And in that case, it's totally fine to, to publish it because uh, we believe it's not easy to implement such an algorithm for someone who wants to, uh, um, to take advantage of this. And like the timeline would be maybe um, taking a year or two uh, 
um, to be able to implement such a things and to, to make it work on a, on a daily basis. Um, so I would say the only research papers uh, you see on finance are this kind of papers where um, it's still not easy to, um, to make it work um, for a large bank or um, hedge funds on a daily basis. Um, let me jump in here real quick. So I think another difficult part for probably the banks is that they have to explain why their black box in the network decided that way if something goes um, goes bad because they have like to justify every decision that they're taking. So I think this is another uh, obstacle that they have somehow to overcome in order to roll that stuff out probably to, to the investors. Um, yeah, but like if, if, look, if that interests you, um, just get back to me at some point through uh, our um, ACE webpage and, and so on, because then I could tell you a bit more about the work that Teichmann is doing uh, in this field. So he was also working with JP Morgan, for instance, on their deep hatching paper, I think it was, and, and so on. So, but it's a very active um, research field at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. And thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Thanks. Any further questions? You can just raise your hand if you have one. In that case, if there are no further questions, once again, thanks a lot, Alexis, for this great talk. We will post everything afterwards on YouTube, LinkedIn, and so on, so that people can get in touch with you if they have further questions. And like that, uh, I would like to say thanks. And everybody that wants to stick around, you can just stick around for one more minute. That will not be recorded. Otherwise, you can just enjoy the start of the week. Yeah, and thanks we will see you with the next talk. Uh, giving me the opportunity to present this, uh, this work. I really enjoy it. And uh, thanks again for what you do with all the meetups. Uh, that's really great. Thank you. And thanks thanks again for, uh, for taking time for this. Thank you so much.